Coming to you straight from the Rio Grande and beyond and beyond broadcasting to the four corners of the globe so grab your seat your coffee or your sundowner okay everybody here we go on point as always this is gloves off gloves off We're back at you and gloves off. I'm Professor Buitor and I'm here with Master Tommy Burks and we're touching base on Kempo and a little bit about what Kempo means to both of us. And uh, of course, uh, Master Burks has been doing it longer than I have. And uh, yeah, I, you know, I met the first time I ever I met Tommy Burks was, I call him Tommy because he's family to me, but um, was, I was 18 years old. <laughs> Now, now I'm 52. Uh, Master, how are we doing today? Are you doing good? Doing good. Uh, started rehab on a uh, shoulder and uh, right rotor cuff surgery I had to have about uh, seven weeks ago, but it's, it's going good. So looking forward to being back on the mat and being able to hit somebody. <laughs> well, it's, uh, you know, surgeries are, are tough. We have to Take our time, but do it correctly. And I know you'll do that. And everything will be fine, especially a surgery of that nature. But it's, it's, com it's common. It's common for us that, you know, through the years in the martial arts stuff, yes. kind of. Works. But let's touch base on Kempo. How, what does Kempo mean to you? Let's take it that way, because I've never asked that question to anybody. What does Kempo actually mean? <laughs> Well, I actually, to uh, kind of express that, I'd have to back up to actually when I started in the martial arts, and that was June 15th, 1966, and I started Taekwondo that day. Two significant things happened to me that day. My son was born that morning. Back then, you could only see your, uh, your spouse and the baby for about 15, 20 minutes, and they kicked you out of the hospital. So after they kicked me out, I went out and joined a Taekwondo class under... Uh, Mike Steen, which was Alan Steen's little brother. And, sure. uh, you know, I, I spent a lot of years in that system and, and made black belt in that system under actually Larry Castor, who was considered the toughest black belt that ever came out of the Alan Steen regime. And I got to train with some extremely uh, talented people like Skipper Mullins and Demetrius Vanus, Roy Kerbin, uh, Ray McCallum, Joy Turboville, and the list goes on and on. But it, it, uh, I was missing something I, that I couldn't find. And, and uh, you know, I, I really wasn't into tournaments, and I really was seeking more uh, self-defense oriented uh, information that I was looking for. And so I got over into the Okinawan system for close to two years and made black belt ranking in that system also. But I was, still hadn't found what I was looking for. So after 19 years, 10 and a half months, uh, I actually walked in and I joined a uh, Kempo class. And uh, I attended class and I, and I really wasn't, impressed what I was what I was seeing and but I had paid for a month lesson so I went back again and I happened to run into one of uh, mine and your brothers uh, a guy named Jeff Dukes sure. and uh, he actually advised me to uh, go on my own and uh, work on learning this and if he could help me he would help me and he got me hooked up with Mr. Parker and I became a school and that was May 1st 1986 and I instantly realized that I had found what I'd always been looking for and uh, you know I was told I had one year to get ready and test for black belt since I I was given a provisional black belt since I had black belts in other system I was given one year to uh get ready and test for black. Well, exactly one year later, May 1st, 1987, I tested in front of uh, Mr. Parker, uh, Mr. Planis, Mr. Pick, and uh, 
some guy that you know, uh, a gentleman named Key C, and uh, for my first degree black belt. Now, Mr. Parker was quite shocked because I knew all the requirements from yellow belt through first black, which meant I'd learned 154 base technique and 48 of the extensions for those techniques, all the forms, all the sets for that belt level. And, uh, you know, Mr. C was nice enough. Mr. Parker was staying with him that weekend. And he invited everybody that had been on the test to come over to his house and spend some time with Mr. Parker if they wanted to. And I took him up on that offer. And I actually got to spend about an hour and a half uh, virtually talking to Mr. Parker one-on-one. And, uh, you know, he was showing me the new manuals he put out, et cetera. And uh, he expressed to me that he was quite surprised when he seen me doing extensions on that test because he didn't, he wasn't aware of anybody in Texas knowing the extensions. Well, almost a year later, it was actually 10 months later, I had a former friend of mine uh, who was a black belt in Taekwondo had came into Kempo and, and he actually came to me and uh, he was approaching his one year period of testing and wanted to train under me. And so uh, I took him in and I got him ready to test. And I called Mr. Parker and asked Mr. Parker if he was going to be anywhere in the vicinity of Texas because I had this guy I needed to test. Mr. Parker asked me, he said, uh, do you know the second degree black belt material? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, okay, you're testing also. And I said, yes, sir. And, uh, you know, it wasn't a question if I wanted to, it was a, it was a statement that you were going to test. Well, during this time I had went through a divorce and a lot of other things. So I had a lot of turmoil in my life and I was currently, uh, with a young lady. Uh, that when we started towards Albuquerque on, on March 24th, 1988, she gave me an ultimatum that it was either her or Kempo. And I said, well, sweetie, I hate to see you go, but if that is your decision, I will honor that decision. And she started crying and she said, I don't understand. And I said, you know, you can turn around and walk out the door tomorrow and leave and everything be over with us. And I said, but what Kempo has given me, nobody can ever take away from me. Well, obvious to say she was mad all the way to Albuquerque. And, uh, you know, I tested the following evening. We spent the night in Amarillo and drove on to Albuquerque the next morning. I tested the next night and she was not allowed to view the test. And then Mr. Parker was given a seminar on Saturday. Well, I'd asked Mr. Parker if I could film the test, and he said yes. So Saturday morning, he asked me, he said, uh, Mr. Burks, are you going to film the seminar? And I said, well, sir, I've, been, I've heard you don't generally let people film seminars. And he said, well, generally I don't, but that's not what I asked you. Are you going to film the seminar? And I said, yes, sir. So I ran down and got my camera, and I asked my girlfriend if, if she would run the camera, and she goes, no, I don't want to do that. But I finally talked her into it. And Mr. Parker started the seminar and he put us to work, uh, showed us some stuff, put us to working on it. And he turned around right around and headed straight to BJ. <laughs> it was so, so funny. She looked like a little mouse that had this big, huge cat coming after her. She was terrified. And Mr. Parker went over there and he started talking to her. And finally I seen her kind of relaxing. So, you know, Mr. Parker, come back out. He watched us a little bit and showed us something else and headed straight back, straight back over to BJ. And now she's kind of grinning. And then, you know, a little bit later, she's laughing and carrying on and just having a great time talking to Mr. Parker. So, <clears throat> uh, the unfortunate part of that story is I, I couldn't wait to get home to download that video to see what Mr. Parker was talking to her about. And, uh, but anyway, after the seminar, we, we run back to the hotel to get changed so we could go out to eat that night. And she looked at me and she goes, okay, now I understand. 
And from that point on, she always supported me in doing what I was doing in Kempo. And uh, as of this day, we're still married. Well, that, so you know, anyway, that is a, I get home and I... Yeah, that, is a, that, is, that is an awful story because I'm going to tell you one thing. A lot of people stop martial arts because of the girlfriend telling them that. That exact thing. And they quit. <laughs> I've had champions that are going to go to state golden gloves. I've had champions that are going to, to U.S. nationals. And all of a sudden, I'm sorry, professor, but my girlfriend said that she'll leave me if, if I continue fighting. And we lost a person that could have been great. And, it, you know, so every once in a while, we have your stories that, that just like yours, that they stick right next to you and they become – the soulmate that's that, that that better half, and uh, unfortunately in the martial arts that's what that's what stops many from continuing. The girl I call it the girlfriend syndrome, you know, and uh, <laughs> it happens. But uh, continue. So anyway, you know, I was so anxious to get home so I could download this this uh, video because I wanted to hear what Mr. Parker was saying to PJ. Well, every time that Mr. Parker walked over to BJ, she put the camera on pause. So, you know, all of that got lost. But, you know, but that, that kind of exemplifies what Kempo has given me. Now, through the first basically 20 years of my martial arts experience, there was something that I was looking for that I couldn't find. Now, being fortunate enough to have, have Mr. Castor as my instructor when I got up through the ranks and got ready to test for black, it gave me the confidence that as a general rule, if I wound up having to defend myself on the street or defend my family or friends on the street, I had the knowledge to do that. But there was a question mark there that there were things I hadn't been exposed to that could happen to me on the street that I didn't feel like I had the ability that I could probably handle. Correct. You know, six months into Kempo, I had learned more about self-defense <clears throat> than I felt like I'd learned in, in 20 years. And at you that know, point, you are, you are absolutely correct, you know, and, uh, Growing up with it, you can see that, and every, and I tell this to everybody: every black belt, every master of Kempo that's out there, every professor, every sifu is a piece of that puzzle, and one of them can tell you one way, and then all of a sudden the other one can just be doing it and playing around, and then you this whole another open chapter opens up to you, and you say, oh, "I didn't see it that way." And you are exactly right. You know, what you see, what you observe, and your experience is, is, is different. Well, the, you know, one of the things that, it, that, that shocked me extremely the, uh, on August 25th when I tested for second black and was promoted to second black, after that exam, Mr. Parker came up. And he put his arms around me and he goes, you know, he said, I know you don't have an instructor, but now you do. You're my student and I will take care of you. And I was just really totally blown away and so humbled by that. It was unreal. Uh, and, you know, Mr. Parker actually, before I left Albuquerque, said, I've got some things I want you to work on when you get home. And next time I see you, we will discuss this. And that, he said, you're already doing it to a, a certain extent, but I want you to take this to a higher level. And that was controlling height, width, and depth. Uh, and that's one of the things that, unfortunately, I see too often watching people, uh, especially on YouTube, doing tempo. They're not controlling the att attacker's height, width, and depth. Depth. You know, you also have to look at, you have to learn to control your height, width, and depth. And if you control that height, width, and depth on an attacker, you start eliminating him being able to counter anything that you're doing generally. So, 
Uh, to me, you know, Mr. Parker stressed that. That's one of the things that I stress extremely high to my students. Uh, and that is done by either contact and or uh, control manipulation. I see a lot of people doing Kempo that do a lot of contact, I mean, a lot of contact manipulation, but they don't do a whole lot of control manipulation. And uh, currently for the last three years, I've been working on a knife curriculum based strictly on American Kempo. And that is uh, one of the major ingredients of that knife curriculum. And I'll be releasing that. Uh, actually, I, I was hoping to have it released by January of this year. And then this shoulder deal came up and delayed that several months. But we're going to get that out there this year. I've, I've already finished the basic level. We're front, uh, currently filming the uh, beginner level. And then there's going to be three to four more levels after that. So, but again, awesome. you know, uh, and one of the other one of the other things that I feel like I gained by this professor is when I was in the other systems, I felt a part of that group. What I didn't feel was uh, individuality, if that's even a word, it may not be. And what's what's to me what's really sad. Uh, if we look at everything that's going on in the world today, governments are trying to take that away from people. Uh, you know, it's uh, e e even wearing mask ha has a tendency to uh, contribute to that. So if, if I'm walking down the street and uh, I see my good friend, Professor Boutron, come in the other direction and he's got this big mask on, I may not even know who he is. May not sure. recognize him unless he says something. And so we, we kind of lost that. So to me, that's one of the things that, uh, you know, Mr. Parker didn't want me to be a, uh, try to be a clone of him. And, and again, we, we see this a lot today. Uh, students trying to be a clone of their instructor. Mr. Parker wanted you to be the best you could be. Uh, again, I can't emulate what Mr. Parker did, but I could, I've always strived to be the best Kempoist uh, and a, represent him as a black belt. You know, every day when I put on a uniform and a belt and I walk on the mat and I look at Mr. Parker's picture and I salute him, and I always think, you know, if Mr. Parker was here, would he be proud of me? And if ever there a day comes that to me that answer is not yes, then I will take that belt off and hang it up. You know, Master, you, you said great words, and the, 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 what you've mentioned right now is individuality. And in Campo, it teaches you that, or it should teach you that and as when you as you're learning it if you try to copy your instructor you can you can follow a form or that what I'm talking about in the sense of fighting if you try to copy when it comes time to do do it in reality god forbid you have to use it in the sense of reality it has never become you so that's when people get into trouble. You have to actually absorb it, understand it, for you to be able to express it. And if you can't express it on your own free will and accord, you always have to copy. That's when the danger comes in, in the sense of reality. That's my opinion. Example of that, when I was in the Okinawan system, I had a Japanese instructor who was about five foot two. Now, if you was one of his students and you was six foot four, he wanted your stance links to be the same as his, which gave you no stability. And, you know, when I started training with him, I was looking at all these people and they were all out of balance. And I finally convinced him that that wasn't a good idea. And of course, Mr. Parker in the Kempo system, we tailor everything to the individual. We don't tailor the individual to strict 
uh, restrictions on you know what they have to do. It's like Mr. Parker says, not everybody wears a size 44 jacket. Exactly. Exactly. And that's where it comes down to. And that's, I'm, that leads me to the next question. And the next question will come out through observing and listening to what happens out there. A lot of people, you know, they know that you've been in martial arts. They know that I've been in martial arts. They know that we've been in martial arts for a very long time. And they always ask a question, would, your, would what you do work in today's society? And they're always, they're always referring to the traditional, because everything's traditional. Even American Kempo is, is a traditional art now. But what I'm saying is they claim traditional arts like the old karate arts, the old system arts, the old, um, where there's a, those fixed stances that you said, the lower stance, stances. They compare that with, with Kempo. And then they say, would it work in today's society? What would your answer be? Well, to me, what I learned uh, in Taekwondo, especially the Okinawan system, uh, you know, if, if I'd adhered to, especially in the Okinawan systems, uh, stances and stuff like that, I would have had problems on the street. The one thing that I, I love about American Kempo, Mr. Parker, uh, for instance, I had a technique one time and I told Mr. Parker, I said, Mr. Parker, I can't make this technique work the way it's written. He said, so can you take the equation formula and uh, change it and make it work? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, so what's the problem? And I said, I kind of smiled. And I said, well, I don't guess there is, any, is one. And what Mr. Parker's remarks was, he said, you have to remember everything in Kempo is logical motion. And if it's not logical, don't do it. So for instance, in, in our, uh, in the Kempo curriculum, there are a lot of techniques that they call category completion techniques. But uh, if you look at Mr. Parker's material, you will, you will not find any place that he describes category completion. And so, you know, there are some techniques that were set up and they're easy to recognize when you've seen them to complete category completion. And sometimes it's kind of illogical to do it that way. You know, for instance, if I'm saying if, if I'm gonna throw a vertical punch high, I have to throw it low, I have to throw it medium, I have to throw it to my left, and I have to throw it right. So, but again, what Mr. Parker told me, he said, if it's, if it's, it's not logical, don't do it. So when I come to category completion techniques, that is obviously category completion techniques, I re-examine them and say, do I need to change something that I would actually do on the street? If I look at a technique, and I say, you know, every technique I've ever done, it's one advantage of me not having an instructor when I first got into this. Now I got to, uh, you know, work out with Jeff Dukes about three or four times and I got to attend some seminars and stuff like this. So that was very beneficial. But by me not having an instructor, and at the time the manuals were written fairly bad, uh, some of the descriptions was wrong uh so i'd have to get a student in front of me which was kind of amazing because with me being in kempo within uh six to eight weeks i had people coming to me wanting to train under me so which was great because now i had some students that i could work on all this with so every technique in the system i had to sit down and i had to read it i had to put a student in front of me have him do the attack and see if i could do what was written uh, down in the description. If not, I had to figure out what angles was wrong, et cetera. Uh, maybe, you know, in Mr. Parker's equation formula, it gives you a lot of things you can do. You can prefix a uh, technique, you can su suspect it, you can delete, you can insert, you can regulate, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that gave you a method to go in there and look at this, and if some things needed to be changed, change it. And I've never hesitated to do that. Because again, I've, you know, uh, 
I've never, haven't been in any street confrontation since I've got in Kempo, which uh, again, which is good. Uh, I had a few uh, in my childhood, especially my teenage years. And I actually had a few when I was in Taekwondo. And luckily I, you know, when I was Taekwondo, I walked away from all those. And uh, one of them was against two attackers. But when I got into Kempo, I started looking at the other side. You know, I, then I started worrying about how bad would you hurt somebody if you use this? Now, so again, that's the tiger side. The dragon side is you get more wisdom, uh, et cetera. You start controlling it. Now, I went back into law enforcement for four and a half years. I arrested twice as many people as any deputy that worked for the sheriff's office. In four and a half years, uh, four, uh, four of those years, I was commissioned to carry a taser. Uh, and, and tasing somebody was probably on my bucket list. I'm not saying it is or it wasn't, but uh, again, fortunately, I never had to tase anybody. Uh, my patrol sergeant in one year tased 19 people. Now, and out of, in four and a half years, I only had to put hands on two individuals who decided that they weren't going to go to jail peacefully. And, uh, and that was handled in a situation where within seconds, I had a person in cuffs and was putting them in my patrol unit. And, but, you know, I approached everybody on the street like I would like for them to approach me. Now I walked up to individuals and instantly, you know, they're offensive and they're cussing me and carrying on. And I'd always tell them, you know, two ways we can do this. And because when I walked up to a person, I called them Mr. So-and-so. And I didn't get rude and obnoxious when I did that. And I said, you know, we can handle this one of two ways. We can handle it the way I approached you or the way that you're approaching me. And like I say... Uh, in four and a half years with all the people that I arrested, and I don't have a number of what that is, but uh, Sunday mornings I was covering 953 square miles by myself from 7 o'clock to 1 o'clock, and I spent all that time serving warrants. So, again, that's another thing that Kempo gave me that, that I didn't have before uh, where you could settle that. And... Uh, you know, and, and the nice thing, I had a police officer walking into my school over in, in Grand Prairie one time when I was teaching over, and he goes, you know, he said, I'd love to learn this, but from what I understand, this is way too violent for police work. And I said, well, you know, I've been in law enforcement previously, and I said, I don't agree with that. I said, you're carrying a baton, and it was the... Uh, Tonfa-like batons, I think they're P-230s or something like that. And I said, so if you pull that baton out, do you have to beat somebody to death with it? He goes, no. And I said, yeah, and that's what Kempo gives you. It gives you the ability to be able to use as little force as necessary, but take that to the maximum if you have to take it there. And I asked him, I said, so you carrying a uh, I said, what kind of sidearm you carry? He said, I'm carrying a 45. And I said, let me ask you this. If there was a crowd outside this building that was going to kill you, would you rather have that 45 or an Uzi? And he goes, I'd rather have an Uzi. I said, yeah, that's taking it to the maximum. I said, so again, I could either have a 22 or I could have an Uzi. That's what Kempo gives me. So again, it's, it's given me a lot of things in life that's helped me through a lot of different phases of my life. You know, it helped me when I was in business for myself. So, you know, you're, it's an you're art, correct, but you, you know, have to live it in home. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. You know, I start, when I started it, I started it off, off around, uh, I was 17, like I said, and uh, met you all when I was 18. Um, it was something that has been with me throughout has been something that has gotten me in and out of trouble, more, more than so out of trouble. But uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about is that it's something that is 
that is that is part of of each one of us, and uh, it is something that you try to give to the students that you that you train. That smile, that same smile that was given to us when we were learning, and hopefully that smile becomes so enjoyable that it becomes part of their life as well. And if God forbid they need to use that, that they are capable enough to be able to get out of that situation that's, that's confronting them. And I think that's what it, uh, it boils down to, capable. Most of the black belts that I know are capable in, in, in Parker Temple. They're capable of getting out of the situation in comparison to other arts where they're not capable. And I'm talking yeah. about, uh, and I'm talking about instances of reality. Only because you have, and everybody says, "Oh, he's a black belt. You better watch out." And but there's from black belts to black belts, schools to schools, styles to styles, and what else is out there, you know? And is that person capable of doing it, or is that person not capable? And that capability is something that I want to thank all the Sifus and professors and masters of, of Kempo for continuing to strive to produce in their students. Granted, not all the students, uh, the level of capability dif uh, differs, but they're all going to be capable enough once they attain that, 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 uh, that belt. And what I say, what I tell people is this, Kempo is non, non it doesn't stop, it continues. It's ever flowing. It's, a, it's an art that's continually living and it's continually changing. You have basics, you have intermediates, you have advanced techniques. You have basic, uh, um, you, the principles are the same, but it's always going to evolve. Why? Because we start seeing new fighting systems emerge and we actually have to adapt to those fighting systems as they're emerging now because they weren't around 20 years ago, not 30 years ago, more or less 40, 50 years ago when Kempo, American Kempo Parker system was being designed, okay? And we have to remember that, you know, there's arts now that weren't around in the 60s and 70s when this was a pinnacle of self-defense. There's things that have come out that you don't want to see it in the, in, in the street for the first time, so you have to adapt yourself to be able to, to defend that. And uh, that, to me, I think that's what Campbell is. You know, that, that law of the fist will continue moving forward, but you have to realize what else is out there for you to be able to continue moving forward. You know, I totally agree with that, sir, because one of the things I always tell my students, the worst thing that can happen to you is someone do something on the street that you've never trained for. That gets back to Mr. Parker's uh, definitions of speed, you know, a perceptional, mental, and physical. And uh, so, you know, generally so many people these days walk around completely oblivious to everything that's going on around them. And uh, so there's that perceptional part, but, even if, if you see something happen, again, that you've never trained for uh, or something similar to that, you have to mentally digest that and figure out how to physically counter that. And again, that can be seconds, but that can, that can mean the difference in life or death. Absolutely, absolutely. I wanna th um, thank you, my brother. I want to thank you, Ma Master Tommy Burks, for continuing pushing forward and instilling that into everybody. Uh, we're running out of time. And folks, if you're in the North Texas area, please visit uh, Master Burks School. I'll, uh, where, 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 how can they get a hold of you? Uh, the best way to get a hold of me is my email, which is tommyburks at northtexaskempo.com. Uh, you know, that, that'd be the, the best way to get a hold of me. And again, if, if uh, I'm fr friends with you on Facebook, you can contact me by messenger. I'm also fixing to switch over to MeWe here fairly quick since uh, 
Facebook is censoring uh, so much out of, of everybody's lives right now uh, at their discretion. Uh, but I haven't done that yet. I'm setting it up. So, but, and I'll let people know when I do that. Absolutely. But thank you, sir, for letting me, you know, have this time on here. Absolutely. Anytime. And we'll continue it because this dialogue has to be open and we can, we can talk later on about certain scenarios and take it that route because I think that's what people need to understand. I want to thank you once more and thank you for your friendship for so many years your family and that's just the way it is folks until next time peace my pleasure sir Today, in America, more than 5.5 million men, women, and children train in a martial art regularly. Bowie Tarun Academy has been serving Laredo for over 30 years now. Our adult classes are geared for producing the best in you, teaching you street-ready techniques. With the arts of Savat and Kinpo, you'll learn the traditions of these sciences of combat as passed down professor to student. Hello, everybody. My name is Senior Grandmaster of Fede Bandalam, owner of BDP, Bandalam Masih Paris. I'd like to say a few words on Grandmaster Paul Bitron. He's a man of great integrity, a man of great knowledge of martial art. He's a master of Sabbat and master of Iskrima. He's a man that can help you to become what you want to be. He's a man that teaches people how to be somebody in life, how to be, how to work the world how to be happy in this world. He's a man that I can say hold many, many integrity as well as in martial art. But I'd like to say this man has a radio station that's hunting all over the world. And he works with all kind of people, all walks of life. All I, all I want to say that Paul Bitron is a man that can help people to be somebody in life. I'd like to say aloha. Thank you. I am Grandmaster Michael Duran of Original Here on the School of Federation here in Vallejo, California. Professor Paul Bitron is an accomplished martial artist who has developed an understanding that as a caretaker, in our martial arts, it is his responsibility to keep the art alive and in depth. He acknowledged that it is the students that give the art life. I hold his friendship and his continuing accomplishments in the art in the most highest regard. Thank you. Come train at the best kept secret of Laredo. Give us a call for your free evaluation at 956 401 4868 or check out our website at savat.biz. Follow us on YouTube and Facebook.